want to welcome everyone as always. We do a little bit of housekeeping at the beginning of Grand Rounds. We want to make sure everybody knows about the CM, the CME codes on the left. I cannot say enough about Dr. Bignall. Everybody has to come to this Grand Rounds next week and everybody needs to spread the word. He is this extraordinary, uh, just this extraordinary um, voice uh, for around issues and racism and, and how it impacts our families and what we can learn. He's just incredibly compelling and we're thrilled to pieces um, that he's going to be coming to give grand rounds. It's something, an event we've been planning for over a year. Um, and then again, and also so fortunate to have Davika, who's the acting California Surgeon General and a graduate of our General Pediatrics Fellowship as our speaker at the fifth annual Diversity and Inclusion Forum. Forum. So as we come to the end of sort of our academic year and grand rounds, these really spectacular uh, presentations. Next slide. Uh, and then just expanding on the announcement about the diversity and inclusion forum, not just uh, Devika obviously is our keynote, but a really compelling um, program. This is really a highlight of the year and a place in which pediatrics is leading for the entire school of medicine, and dare I say the entire university. So please be sure to take a look at that agenda. Um, and then the keynote will be during this slot. Next slide. Um, this is also such a special time to celebrate um, all of our faculty and our staff, and we have a wonderful roster of awards, and the awards day will take place in the auditorium, so that's exciting in and of itself, but please, please, uh, you know, take advantage, do, the nominations are due May 31st, um, and please take advantage of the opportunity to celebrate our faculty and staff. Next slide. Um, and then we're really delighted now. The MCHRI seminar series is relatively new. It's a wonderful monthly series to learn more about what's happening on campus. And Anna Gloin, our uh, associate uh, chair for, you know, for uh, basic science research, who's become such a voice for research across the school, is going to be presenting with one of her trainees. Okay, great. Uh, thank you all very much. It's uh, absolutely wonderful uh, to be here today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hyman, for joining us. Uh, it is a, a great pleasure to have you here. For those that don't know Dan, uh, who is uh, currently um, uh, Zooming to us from uh, the barn here on Stanford's campus, and we'll be uh, touring the hospital a little bit later. Uh, Dr. Hyman has a uh, rich career. Uh, I won't go into all uh, of it because it would take uh, the entirety of the uh, lecture here, but um, he has many, many touch points uh, with Stanford Children's and has been a mentor to a tremendous number of us, uh, including you know, uh, many of our former quality uh, leaders. Uh, this is not Dr. Hyman's first time uh, presenting to us. I think, was it, was it right, Dan? You're here about uh, eight years ago. Yeah, it was six. I found the talk. So it was, oh, it was six years ago. Great. Yeah. And uh, at the time, I think you skewered Dr. Sherrick pretty well. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Hyman uh, currently serves as the chief patient uh, safety and quality officer at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, overseeing their uh, quality and uh, improvement functions, uh, and previously has served in similar roles at uh, uh, Children's uh, at, uh, in uh, Colorado and also at uh, in New York Presbyterian. Uh, it is an absolute honor and privilege to have you here, uh, Dan, and uh, thank you so much for uh, meeting with us today and uh, yesterday, and we look forward to being able to continue uh, collaborating with you as, um, in the years to come. With that, I'll turn it to you, Dr. Hyman. Thank you, Terry, for doing the introduction. Welcome. Thank you. Um, and I'm really, uh, let me just second your, your uh, um, comments about Dr. Bignall, who's coming next week. I heard him speak. He did a pop podcast at, uh, at PAS several weeks ago and had a chance to hear from him. You're in for a real treat. Um, and you know, while we're talking about equity, um, I was going to say one other thing um, as I, I kicked off this morning, which is that uh, as we're thinking about learning, and this talk this morning is about learning from every opportunity, one of the things that our work on diversity, equity, and inclusion has led us to be thinking about is how we create safe container spaces for people to feel comfortable speaking um, and learning. And so I've added to my signature line my he, him pronouns, which I had not really done for a long time and didn't fully understand it, but um, we'll share that with you as a way of saying that um, we're welcoming of everybody and every voice, and in order for us to learn continuously, we're going to have to make sure we're hearing from all voices in the rooms as we gather. So um, with that, I will um, uh, say that I have no financial conflicts to disclose, um, but I should disclose, as, as Terry said, that I've been here before, and I found some of the pictures of Paul Sherrick that 
uh, peppered that talk, which was oriented around uh, Cotter's change management model. And we had a lot of fun um, poking fun at our friend Paul Sharrick about him showing us how not to do the Cotter change management model. So um, I appreciated being invited then and Lane reaching out and asking me to come back this morning. Um, so the three primary objectives that um, I wrote for this talk were that people would be able to um, describe the principles that guide case review using a just culture approach, um, discuss the importance of both safety one and safety two approaches to learning, and be able to talk a little bit about how our challenges may differ when we're learning from diagnostic error. And I'm gonna spend a fair bit of time um, on learning from that sort of problem uh, uh, towards the latter second half of the talk, talk this morning. Uh, here we go. Um, so um, I've been starting my talks with the, so what is in the end, in case people need to leave early, but also just to orient you to where I'll be going over the next 45 minutes or so. Um, so these are the seven or eight take home points. Um, first that I think it's possible to improve safety culture locally within clinical microsystems, even if hospital wide change is slow and leaders in every area, clinicians in every area have the opportunity to use these tools in your work every day um, and can really change the environment for learning and um, reducing the feeling of blame. Um, it's obviously important that we always learn from adverse events. Uh, doing that while promoting just culture is challenging, and we're going to explore that during the course of the talk. Um, we'll talk about the importance of transparency, um, and I'm going to spend a bit of time on this concept of safety, too. I know you've, you've been thinking about it a lot here at Stanford, and I want to explore some of the ideas about not just learning from what goes right, but also designing our systems to be reliable. Uh, it's really important that we understand the theories of human error in promoting just culture and the theories of cognitive bias as we try to learn from diagnostic error. And as I said, there may be some differences in how we approach diagnostic error reviews from other sorts of adverse occurrences. And, you know, we have not been able to prove that the work that we're doing within solutions for patient safety or in our hospitals related to culture are contributing or contributing greatly to the successes that we're seeing to the extent that we success, see successes in harm reduction. But I really do believe this culture work is essential to, to what we're doing. I wanna start with a brief story. Um, this is from a nurse who worked with me and my patient safety team in Colorado, who when she was early in her career as a neonatal ICU nurse, had a baby that she was taking care of who was deteriorating. And as the team was um, working on responding to the child's change in condition, um, an attending physician came in and said to this very junior nurse uh, in a disrespectful way, you know, what did you do to my patient? And it was a scarring encounter for that nurse that really stays with her to this day. And she continues to talk about how damaging it was to be treated that way by this um, uh, colleague um, when all she was trying to do was do the best that she could for her patient. And it obviously does not have to be that way. I'm gonna spend, a, uh, and uh, some of you are coming to a talk that I'm gonna give later this morning um, that I've called Quotes to Live By. So you'll know the, the answer to this quote that it's uh, Lucian Leap from Harvard who said that the single greatest impediment to error prevention in our industry is that we punish people for making mistakes. And um, uh, you know, that's such a core component of just culture that we understand that, that it's in a lot of the talks that I give. We have all just experienced seeing what punishment looks like after a medical error. I'm going to say a little bit more about Redonda Vaught later in the talk, um, but I did have a chance to see the communication that came out from Stanford's leadership at both the adult system and here um, in the Children's Hospital and thought it was, it was perfect. I thought it was a spot on, beautiful statement about the support that we need to provide to all of our caregivers. Um, uh, criminalizing medical error is, is just awful. And um, I thought the statement was really, really well done. And I'll say more about uh, Renanda Vaught and that case a little bit later. So um, it is a um, primary responsibility of leaders uh, in our healthcare system. And by, I define leader very broadly. I don't just mean people with titles. The attending physician is a leader on his or her care team. The charge nurse is a leader on his or her uh, inpatient unit. Um, we all have an opportunity to lead. And 
um, whether it was in our Target Zero program in Colorado, our Breakthrough to Zero program that we have now at CHOP, or I really love the Mission Zero um, program that you have here at Stanford. Uh, those really creative animal logos are a beautiful thing, and I really appreciated seeing those. Um, these three um, principles on the right, I think, are essential to what we do as leaders, starting with um, promoting a fair and just culture. And that's where I'm going to spend my time today. Um, there's other things, obviously, with rounding and giving feedback, but we're going to focus on just culture today. I had an experience a number of years ago when I was in Denver where I had had a really long day um, and had to drive down to Colorado Springs where our new hospital had just opened and um, got back pretty late at night to Denver, treated myself to a few delicious scoops of Ben and Jerry's chocolate therapy ice cream. Um, and then when I came down in the morning to have whatever I was having for breakfast, found the chocolate therapy ice cream sitting in the refrigerator. And why am I talking about this? Because it's a perfect example of a normal human error, slip, trip, lapse, that was um, promoted by my being fatigued um, and by not having a system in place that did anything to, to prevent me from making this error and wasting my beautiful chocolate therapy ice cream. Now, this is obviously a trivial error, similar to the ones that we make when we get off of an elevator on the wrong floor um, or, you know, um, put our keys in the dishwasher, whatever it is. Um, but it's a good foundation for thinking about the different types of error that we experience. And doing so is necessary as we think about how we understand and promote a fair and just culture. So um, I'm going to go through this pretty briefly. I think this is going to be a review for many of you. Um, you know, I may offer a slightly different nuance thinking about this or you know, slightly different examples than maybe you use, but just to level set for all of us, for anyone who's not familiar with this taxonomy, as we think about error and just culture, the chocolate therapy example is a uh, human error, inadvertent, unintentional, um, and there are so many examples, both in our personal lives as well as in healthcare. Um, I made a mistake because I was reassured by normal lab tests, thought the patient had a virus, um, and my confirmation bias, you know, caused me to miss a diagnosis. Um, I was placing an NG tube in the lung, it, uh, causing pneumothorax, uh, uh, placing an NG tube and went into the lung, causing pneumothorax. I did everything I was supposed to do in terms of checking it, um, but I had a complication for my procedure. Um, I got distracted by a phone call. Um, the, the response to a normal human error is not discipline, it's consolation, it's understanding, it's thinking about how can we learn from what happened in order to, in order to prevent um, the error from occurring um, for another person. Uh, the picture of a you know, gas tank, um, um, a gas pump um, coming off of the actual pump when you drive away from it is the system is designed to do that when people make this mistake. The second category are at-risk behaviors where we make a choice that increases risk, but may not recognize that risk or minimize the um, likelihood of its impact or believe that the, the risk is justified. Um, you can see this example of uh, Boris Johnson and Arnold Schwarzenegger happily riding through a park um, in London uh, without their helmets. They're making a behavioral choice that increases risk. I especially love this other picture of Boris Johnson on his bike because not only is he riding without his helmet, but he actually had immediate access to one right there on his handlebar. Um, so these are choices, um, th th these are examples where um, we, we skip steps. I know this family so well, I don't need to double check their date of birth again. Um, I, you know, I trust this resident to be doing what he or she is doing. I'm going to sign the note. Um, I, I'm minimizing the risk of impact and making a choice that could create a problem. And in this situation, again, we want to be learning with the person who made the error, why they made the error, um, what might have prevented them from doing it, um, and think about how do we coach and um, help someone to not make that person to not make the same choice again, but also how we make sure that others don't similarly make a, a wrong choice and make an at-risk behavior. Um, people do this um, because it's expedient, uh, saves them time, they don't have to ask for help. Um, uh, they're trying to get uh, things done when people are rushed. So this is, this is inherent within our busy care environment that people will skip steps, take risks, and most of the time, uh, it doesn't cause a problem, which just reinforces it. Um, so we really need to understand when and why this is happening and try to 
avoid it being necessary by making it easier for people to do the right thing um, all of the time. The third part of the taxonomy is behavior that's reckless. Um, this is you know, far less frequent, um, but it's the choice to consciously disregard a rule knowing that there is a substantial risk in doing so. Um, you know, I, I, this is an emergency, I'm not doing the timeout, let's go. Um, I know I'm on medication that makes me not think clearly, but I'm gonna work anyway because um, I, I can't take PTO. Um, examples where people know that they're not doing the right thing, that it has risk, and they go ahead and do it anyway. And in this situation, it's where we bring in discipline. And also certainly in the even more unusual cases where someone is intentionally trying to cause harm, fortunately, highly, um, uh, you know, just incredibly rare in our system, but we do need to make sure that that's not the case as we're evaluating um, behaviors. So what we're looking for in a fair and just culture is application of these principles. Um, we promote a culture where um, we recognize that the highly trained, well-intended people that we work with are going to make human errors. And our focus is gonna be on learning, not blaming, um, and thinking about the system in which the person was working and in which the error was made. This allows us to uh, feel more comfortable that people are gonna feel safe disclosing their errors. And we do need, but we do need to find an appropriate balance between um, just um, not having blame free, there needs to be accountability, and I'll talk about that more in a moment, um, but finding that balance between support and accountability. Too much punishment results in people not feeling comfortable reporting their errors, um, and we miss opportunities to understand the problems and fix our system. Too much tolerance results in a deterioration of the system because the, the whole team declines over time if we're just allowing anything goes. So we do need to find the balance between uh, punishment and tolerance. So in your role, when there is an occurrence, uh, how can you promote just culture in your response to adverse events? The first thing is our response when someone comes to us and says they've made an error um, or a mistake or there's been an adverse occurrence is to thank them for letting you know. If we react in an um, angry, um, annoyed way, any sign that we're upset is not going to promote the person coming back and talking with us again. Um, so thank you for coming to speak with me. Let's now talk about what happened. How do you think this happened? What can we learn from it? And engage the person that was involved or the people that were involved in the situation in understanding what occurred and learn from it. I'm gonna show you just culture algorithm in a minute. Um, and using that in a systematic way, not rushing to your response, allowing yourself to gather the facts in a systematic way will help you to promote just culture in your response to adverse events. So again, here's the taxonomy that, um, that we go back to. I'll just flash it up for a moment. Console for human error, coach for at-risk behaviors, and discipline when people make a conscious choice knowing that they're disregarding a rule um, that's gonna create substantial risk. So let's think for a bit about um, how we react to, a little bit more about how we react to and learn from events that happen. We are awash in incidents being reported to us. Um, this is just a, a chart showing incident reports in our, uh, in our system at Children's in Philadelphia. Um, the drop in events per month is because our pharmacy stopped putting in um, their events reports, topic for a different discussion, but you know, over on average 2,000 or 1,500 events each month being reported into our system. Um, plenty of learning opportunities from things that are in the system. Most of those, of incidents that are reported are in near miss category. So the um, sort of gold and um, uh, top right part of the pie chart are near miss events. The blue are no harm events where they reach the patient, but there was no, um, no negative impact. And um, the kind of rust color on the top left or it wasn't an event, but an unsafe condition. So the vast majority of this pie chart, there's no harm happening to the patient, but all of those things represent opportunities for learning. We had a similar distribution in Colorado in our quality safety reporting system. You can see about 1,200 incident reports a month, um, more than half of them no harm events, and uh, a third of them uh, or more being um, 
near misses. So there's a rich opportunity for learning, but we wind up spending most of our time on the most serious events that occur. Um, this is just a representative pie chart of uh, the sliver of occurrences in our system that are serious safety events. And then, you know, a third of the time or something like that, uh, precursor or near miss events. And then the vast majority of the time, everything's fine. Nothing is reported in our incident reporting system at all. But if we think about where do we allocate our time and attention, it's by and large on the red sliver. Our opportunity for learning from the green is generally lost. We don't follow up on it. We don't even think about it. And even in the yellow, we often miss opportunities to learn from that amount of, um, of activity in our healthcare systems. And so thinking about how do we learn from every opportunity involves thinking about this entire pie chart of all of the activity that occurs in our system. And that's what we're thinking about when we start talking about safety too. So our, our work for the last 20 years in safety one has been um, retrospective look back at things that went wrong. There was a malfunction, it resulted in an accident, um, there was an error, and it resulted in unacceptable outcomes. And that's where we have focused our attention in that retrospective safety one world. In safety two, what we are thinking about is there's variability in the work that we do every day. And when people make adjustments and changes and they, they um, don't follow standard practice, it's generally in pursuit of an acceptable outcome, which they achieve. And there is rich opportunity for learning by seeing how people are doing their work, what the workarounds are that they're having to, um, to follow, uh, what the uh, hurdles are that challenge them in their day that we can understand again in order to make it easier for them to do the right thing. Um, so we wanna be thinking in both directions, um, safety one and safety two. So as we transition to do that and think about how do, how do we learn from what goes right? So again, first of all, it's not always the way we imagine work to be. It's variations, deviations that people make um, and good things happen that we wanna understand. But there's also, um, I think an opportunity when we see excellence, when things go incredibly well to evaluate it with the same kind of systematic approach that we take when there's a serious adverse event. And I'll give you two examples, one where, we're at, where I felt we did not do a great job learning and one where we did. Um, the first case was in Colorado. We had a patient who um, had presented to our emergency department after a polypharmacy ingestion, was in the ED, and our um, pediatric ICU staff were monitoring this kid um, from the ICU, seeing what was happening um, with her, and um, were really uncomfortable with her rhythm, her cardiac rhythm, and called down to the ED, and they said, we think that you should get this girl on ECMO now. Don't wait, because she's going to arrest. And the team mobilized, they put her on ECMO. Um, she went to the ICU, within a couple of days she had stabilized, left, went to get the psychiatric care that she needed. And we thought, wow, that was, that was amazing. Why did that happen? And tried to learn from what had occurred and really struggled. Um, I think it takes practice to learn how to do this. You know, we came up with, well, it happened to be a Thursday afternoon and uh, we had redundant staff in the ICU. They were able to monitor what was happening. They remembered a case um, from some number of months ago with a similar polypharmacy ingestion and a similar dysrhythmia that resulted in an ECMO red situation um, and the death of the patient. And so we, you know, we did what we could to try to learn from it, but I never really felt like we got to where we needed to. Had another opportunity to do this just a few months ago in Philadelphia. Um, we had a patient who arrested outside on the street, um, outside the hospital on the street, and an anesthesiologist from our hospital was leaving for the day and got the patient, got the patient into the ED, worked with the emergency department staff um, to resuscitate this teenager. And I think there was over 20 minutes. 30 minutes of resuscitation and the patient got to the ICU. Um, it was a patient with cystic fibrosis who had a abdominal surgical um, uh, issue. And after surgery and stabilization, this young man walked out the door at baseline and we said, okay, we need to learn from this. And in this case, we really were able to identify a number of things that have been done in the emergency department over the years in terms of 
response to arrests and training on resuscitation and teamwork um, and the review of the video that um, I really felt like we had done a sweet that the systematic analysis identified the things that were happening in our system that set us up to be able to have that kind of incredible success in this patient um, who you know will now go on to to live live his life. Um, so we can focus on both frequent events and as well as on uh, specific examples of excellence, but really look for opportunities to um, think about why things go well um, as a part of safety to approaches to learning in our healthcare system. The other part of it is designing things to go right from the start. Um, and understanding that we, particularly when we're setting up new programs, when we're building new buildings, um, anytime we're starting something new, um, uh, using human factors approaches and uh, taking a mindset of how is this work going to be done? What are the range of conditions that might impact the way workers are doing their, um, going about their, their business? Um, what happens if our staffing is short on the unit in this day? And really committing to the idea of resilience and the ability to respond as an organization to changes in conditions so that we have consistency and reliability um, in all that we're doing. This isn't easy. I think it requires practice. It requires a change in mindset. Um, having the um, expertise of people who do human factors work has been really helpful to me over the last number of years, both in Colorado and Philadelphia. Um, and we're using those sorts of people as we design some of our new programs and buildings. Um, and I think it's really helping us. Um, so I think I've said most of what I wanted to about, say about safety one and safety two. So I'll just um, talk about one more thing with this, which is the different models that we think about in terms of how we design systems to achieve optimal outcomes. Um, the top left is probably terminology that all of you are familiar with, Don Abedian's structure process outcomes um, uh, framework for thinking about the healthcare results that we achieve. You may have seen the um, cartoon on the right from healthcare performance improvement um, that's been taught in, um, in SPS and other curricula where it's expanded, Don Abedian's approach has expanded out to think not just about structure and processes, but culture and policies and technology and how all of that influences the way um, individuals and groups behave and do their work, and that results in outcomes. But the model that I really like the best is the one here on the lower left, which comes from the world of human factors engineering. It's called SEEPS, um, S-E-I-P-S, which stands for System Engineering to Improve Patient Safety. And it conceptualizes the fact that people are working inside this, I mean, here it's represented as a box, but obviously in a, in a climate and an environment um, where they're interacting with one another, the technology and tools that we have available with tasks that they have to perform um, with the culture of the organization and all of that is creating a complex adaptive system that needs to be understood in its totality in order to, um, to influence the processes that people are going through and the outcomes that we're achieving. So each of these have you know, different levels of, um, of complexity to them, but the general idea that um, our, our systems achieve exactly the results that they're designed to achieves, achieve. And when we are having outcomes that are not as good as we think they can be, we really need to look at this overall system and how our people are working with one another. And again, learning from the way we do our work when things go well, when we have near misses, when we have serious events, all of that can help us to better understand our systems. Um, last thing here on uh, safety two and learning from excellence, I just want to um, commend the work from Adrian Plunkett in uh, the United Kingdom. Dr. Plunkett is actually a cancer survivor himself and um, took from his experience as a patient and his family's experience when he was a patient to really think about how do we recognize excellence and learn from it. A tremendous amount of appreciation goes into the work that Dr. Plunkett is doing. And I don't know um, what it's like here in Stanford, um, 
you know, I've worked in three different hospitals with very different cultures in terms of expectations of excellence, um, appreciation and gratitude for good work. And the more that we can be appreciative and grateful for the people around us and the good job that they do, um, the more we can encourage that excellent work um, and continue to learn from it. So um, uh, the website learningfromexcellence.com, I think is a tremendous resource that I would uh, you know, recommend that you take a look at. All right, so let's talk about um, a little bit more about learning and you know, knowing exactly what is happening in our environment. Um, you know, as I said, I've worked in three hospitals, each of them also with their own um, distinct approaches to transparency uh, and relationship between our patient safety world and risk management and lawyers. And I've been fortunate to have really good partnerships with the legal and risk teams that I've worked with over the years. Not to say that we always agree, we don't. And there are definitely times where I um, need to be corralled a little bit. Um, but our risk management and legal partners are doing their jobs protecting our institutions. And as long as they approach it with an understanding that if we don't talk about the adverse occurrences that happen, we won't learn from them, they will be repeated. And that both creates um, undue risk to our patients and families and risk to the organization. And so there is a risk management benefit to talking about cases and learning. So I don't know what it's like for, for all of you here and what the tolerance is for transparency around adverse events, um, but the more we can partner with risk and legal to um, be transparent and learn from errors, the better I think our systems will be. Now, I wanna tell you about a couple of kids um, and how we learn from them. Uh, this Grant Vischer story I shared when I was here six years ago, and I'm going to use it in a different way today. And then I'm also going to talk about a boy named Ethan and briefly about a girl named Olivia. Um, Ethan and Olivia both were impacted by diagnostic errors. Um, Grant, by an NG tube that was misplaced, fed through, and despite um, uh, signs and symptoms, uh, uh, he arrested and died um, from a malpositioned NG tube. And I shared his story when I was here last time because it created, it helped us create a sense of urgency for launching the safety program that we launched. I wanna talk about it today from the context of learning from it, um, from fair and just culture. So uh, granted had a successful core repair, was um, recovering, um, having his feedings advanced. And on a Saturday after his NG tube had been replaced, um, was just not doing as well. His family expressed concern through the day. The grandparents came later, said he was more blue, more bubbly and gurgly, just didn't seem right. And he unfortunately arrested and one, was unable to be resuscitated and died um, from this NG malposition. And, um, you know, so this was terrible. It was, it was a tragic occurrence. Our obligation was to, of course, support the family, um, but also to think about how do we learn? This is an example of a just culture algorithm from James Reason. You know, it starts with, was there individual, was the, did the individual intend the act? I mean, it's almost always no. Was there evidence of impairment? Almost always no. And then a series of stepwise questions related to whether um, there was a policy or a guideline that was violated, whether it was a workable policy, um, what training was like, um, was there a reason not to follow the policy? And just a systematic review, again, looking at was this a simple human error? Was it a risky behavior? What is it, was it a reckless behavior? And when you go through the algorithm, at least at the time that, um, that Grant died, um, the policy at the hospital was problematic. We recognized that there was not an adequate response to the family's concerns, but that's certainly something where your substitution test would say, yes, that's a risk for, for all of us. And so, you know, the hospital, we, you know, changed the NG placement policy. Um, continued to educate about, you know, families knowing their children best and how do we respond to them. But the really remarkable part of the story is that Grant's mom, Diana, um, joined our patient safety committee, um, became a national and now international advocate for NG2 placement. And so there's been a tremendous amount of learning and positive um, result from you know, the tragedy that Grant and his family experienced. One of my favorite stories um, about Deanna is that um, we would take her on rounds in the hospital. I know you guys here at Stanford have just incredible um, history of patient family engagement and partnership, and I really admire the work that you've done here. 
um, tried to emulate it. And we would take Deanna out on rounds and, you know, sometimes we would go somewhere where a child had an NG tube and without telling them who she was, would ask the nurse about the NG tube and how they put it in, how they know it's in the right place. And one of the nurses one day said to her, said, well, you know, let me explain what we do. And the reason is because we had a baby here several years ago who died, unfortunately, from a misplaced NG tube. And Deanna, you know, with tears in her eyes said, you've just told me my son's story. And thank you for, you know, um, helping me to know that Grant's story is not forgotten. Um, and so this was, uh, you know, one of many situations where our, our involvement with families and learning after they've experienced tragedy has been um, really touching and poignant and has impacted the way I think about the way we do our work. Um, so just a really brief detail tour about Redonda Vaught. It feels, uh, would feel incomplete not to say something about this, um, you know, in the immediate aftermath as we're thinking about how do we learn from errors and do it with a just culture. Um, I think you're all familiar with this case. The nurse um, gave vepironium instead of midazolam. Um, the Omni or PIXA system that they had at Vanderbilt was set up, you know, with this risk, uh, you know, uh, in place. Uh, the nurse certainly missed opportunities to identify the fact she was doing the wrong thing, and but it resulted in the tragic death of um, of a 75 year old patient. Uh, Redonda lost her nursing license, was terminated from her job. And then, you know, in the worst part of it, was charged criminally and convicted for both negligent homicide and um, a second charge related to abandoning a, a disabled adult. So all of that was horrible. Um, fortunately, I thought the judge was a hero in this story, um, finding a way in the language to um, uh, uh, have a sentence that was consistent with the sentencing guidelines, but then being able to use judgment and um, and have Redonda not go to jail. And that was the best result that we could have had um, after this, you know, complete antithesis of what we're looking for in promoting a fair and just culture in the face of human error. Um, previous case with criminalization of this was a pharmacist in Ohio about 15 years ago, or a pharmacy tech uh, made a compounding error, it wasn't picked up by the pharmacist, and a little girl named Emily um, died from the compounding error. And that pharmacist actually went to jail, I think, for about six months. So there are examples where errors are criminalized. It's wrong. Um, and we need to be um, saying the things that we're saying and advocating and finding ways to um, prevent um, any of us from having these sorts of errors be dealt with in the criminal justice system. So let me, um, in the last uh, 10 or 15 minutes here, uh, do two more things. I wanna talk a little bit about diagnostic error. Um, uh, I, I showed two pictures earlier. I'm gonna talk about Ethan's story and just um, say one thing about a little girl named Olivia, um, who's the other diagnostic error that I think about a lot. Um, this story was all over the news in Denver. You may have seen it in Stanford uh, here in California. Um, Olivia was a little girl who died um, from um, Munchausen by proxy. Uh, her mother uh, 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 spent years uh, having us uh, do all sorts of procedures for feeding intolerance related symptoms and eventually uh, took Olivia out of the hospital, to hospice, stopped nourishment and she died. And it was a terrible case. There was a lot of news related to it because uh, it was only until a, it was only a year later when the mom, same mom, brought her other child with similar sorts of issues that it was recognized that um, this was all factitious, and the mother was um, was arrested, charged, um, jailed, um, and it you know was a terrible diagnostic error that has had really difficult implications for all of us, and was difficult to learn from because of the legal situation surrounding the case. Say a little bit more about Ethan's story, um, which is again another example where our partnership with the family has been extraordinary. Um, Ethan was 11, um, came in with uh, headaches to our, one of our urgent care centers in Colorado, had had a migraine type headache a couple of years previously, um, and was assumed to have a migraine again, was treated, released, came back again, had at that point some temperature and vomiting. There was a discussion about getting imaging studies, but it wasn't attained. Again, responded to a migraine cocktail, including steroids, and then had about five or seven days of Depedron where he was really feeling pretty well. And only then when the third presentation, when he came back, did he have um, 
Uh, he actually had an extended EV stay still for fluid and migraine management. And it was only after his admission and a change in mental status um, that it was recognized that he actually had an intracranial process. Um, uh, an emergent CT scan revealed herniation. Uh, he went to the OR um, for this abscess. And ultimately, after I think about 10 or 11 days of heroic care, um, unfortunately, Ethan died. Now, um, this was a really uh, difficult diagnostic error for the, the people who were involved in it. Um, I got this slide from my colleague and friend, Joe Grubenhoff, who's an emergency medicine physician in Colorado, doing a lot of work on diagnostic safety. And you know, this is the negative part of uh, how diagnostic errors might be addressed. The individual who missed the diagnosis feeling awful um, and the concern that others are thinking he or she is a bad clinician. Um, you know, how could he have missed this? How could she have missed this? What were they thinking? And so I think we can take a similar approach to just culture algorithms. The James Reason model is oriented more towards nurses and others who are following policies. This is a um, uh, modification of that that we did uh, with the University of Colorado Adult Hospital and at Children's, which um, focused more on clinical thinking and using a different approach that's not policy oriented, but more relates to um, would others with similar training have been likely to make the same decisions or to, um, uh, to, to miss whatever the signs or symptoms were that resulted in the misdiagnosis. So again, was there intent? Was there impairment? Almost never. And then on into were there, you know, um, were there conscious uh, choices to disregard risk? Again, almost never. Um, but then, you know, was there an error in, in cognitive, um, the cognitive approach to the case? Was there, would, would other caregivers um, have made or done a similar thing? Was there a history of potentially unsafe or questionable practice in the past? And all of that systematically can be used to decide how are we going to respond to our colleague who is, first of all, while needing support for the pain that they're feeling for the error that they made, and how we also you know, think about protecting future patients if someone really needs help in terms of their clinical caregiving. So I'm happy to share that algorithm. It's one that we were working on and developing, but um, um, I think it's a, a way of approaching a systematic review of diagnostic error that um, is similar to James Reason's uh, policy-oriented algorithm that uh, people are more familiar with. So in Ethan's case, there were a range of cognitive biases that were involved. Um, the cognitive bias and diagnostic error talk is a, a, you know, its own separate hour talk. Um, but we also identified systems issues related to handoffs, transitions of care within our network, um, how consult communications happening happened, and what our culture was related to when we do imaging studies, when we sedate, uh, when we move patients from an off-site campus where there's not imaging capability to another site. Um, and we launched a, uh, an initiative to um, increase our understanding of cognitive bias and reduce the risk of diagnostic error. We did a lot of work um, strengthening our case review, uh, training people for how to facilitate morbidity and mortality or case review conferences that were interdisciplinary and collaborative, and recognizing that um, these are really hard for people to talk about, um, but yet we have to talk about them in order to understand our errors and how we can prevent them from happening in the future. And of course, we're still trying to figure out how do we measure um, the frequency of diagnostic errors so that we can work on strategies to see how we're reducing it. Um, there's some really good literature that uh, keeps growing um, related to diagnostic error. This was from a few years ago. Joe, same with Joe Grubenhoff um, published a study about um, how faculty feel about discussing their diagnostic errors and you know, basically it showed even more so for advanced practice providers than for physicians, um, uh, you know, people being worried that their reputations were gonna be hurt by uh, disclosing or having their diagnostic errors revealed. So we have to work on the culture of um, our case reviews in order to support people through this. Um, there was a more recent article actually related to Ethan's case. You can see David Weiner and Farron Weiner. Those are Ethan's father and mother who wrote this article that was published in Pediatrics back in December uh, that I would really recommend taking a look at. Um, it goes into more of Ethan's story and the Weiner's story about um, how they have processed this and how they've partnered with the staff at Children's Colorado to improve our understanding of diagnostic error and to support our trainees and our clinicians as we work on um, reducing the risk of that. 
So um, uh, one other thing about cognitive bias, uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky's uh, Thinking Fast and Slow book, which is terrific, but pretty dense. A more fun book is Michael Lewis's book, The Undoing Project, that is about um, Kahneman and Tversky um, and reviews a lot of the thinking related to cognitive bias. But Michael Lewis, who wrote Moneyball, The Big Short, uh, is just a fun author. And uh, I would commend The Undoing Project if you're interested in reading more and certainly Thinking Fast and Slow as well. So we're certainly never going to get to this point where we say, yay, I made a diagnostic error. But this kind of culture of we're going to talk about the fact that it happened, and I'm going to be supported by my colleagues and peers saying, yes, it could have happened to all of us, and how, we, how are we going to learn from it is the way we want to respond to and think about how do we learn from these diagnostic errors. So last couple of things, I just want to say, you know, just to again reinforce how we respond to adverse occurrences. Um, we don't want to be saying, you know, what happened, who did it? You know, you should have been more careful. I'm going to educate you. These are not effective strategies for learning after adverse events. But the first thing is immediate risk mitigation. You know, what does this patient need? Are there any other patients at risk? Um, we had a case several years ago where um, there was a compounding error of baclofen in our pharmacy in Denver. And a really astute pharmacist recognized that there were two or maybe three patients that were having um, baclofen toxicity symptoms and very quickly figured out that there was a batch of baclofen that had mixed up, been mixed up in the pharmacy that needed to be taken off the shelf. And it was um, Pam Ryder, that pharmacist's really quick recognition that there might be other patients at risk that prevented further harm from occurring. So something happened where you need to um, um, Risk, mitigate the risk to this patient and any other patients that might be impacted and begin to go through a disclosure process where we're um, letting families know what we know um, at the time and the commitment to continue to uh, inform them about what's happened, what we're learning from it and making them a part of that process. And then after that, you know, going through a systematic cause analysis of what happened and why, and what were the system issues that contributed to the errors. Um, this fourth bullet I actually just added, it's one that we've started trying to figure out how do we ask the question of whether or not bias might have contributed to whatever it was that occurred. That is not an easy question to ask. You know, people may respond and say, what are you saying that I, you know, I'm racist and that's why I did this? Um, so um, people are trying to find the right language to bring into a conversation, but we know that there are health disparities in safety, just as there are in clinical outcomes. And we're going to have to figure out how we incorporate an understanding of the impact of bias in our case reviews. And we'll look forward to learning that with you and with our other peer hospitals around the country as we make that a part of our safety systems as we go forward. Um, so again, just really reinforcing the systematic nature of what we do, um, the fact that all of us are operating environments that are complex, uh, need to be resilient and adapt to changes that occur every day, every moment. And as we think about safety too, we ought to be thinking about learning from what's happened, both good and bad, to continuously redesign and improve our systems to promote safety and reliability under that wide range of conditions. Lastly, want to be um, uh, just uh, explicit about the importance of empathy. Uh, our team members experience repeat questioning from multiple different levels of organizations, all well-intended trying to learn, but at a charge nurse or medical director, department chair, safety officer, risk management, you name it. There are multiple people that are wanting to know things that have happened. And we need to make sure that we are um, intentionally bringing empathy into the process so that our team members feel supported going through the review and event that we're trying to learn from and do in a way that um, feels just and fair and supportive. And that is not easy, um, but we'll be much more likely to achieve that kind of empathy if we're intentional about bringing that philosophy into the reviews that we do. So continue to support people. How are you? How can I support you? Share our own stories about how these things have impacted us. Um, some people need to be referred for um, employee support, professional help, 
Um, you know, and then really making sure that people aren't talking about, you know, can you believe that this happened? Um, that's how we promote a, a learning culture, a just and fair culture that we can feel good about. So again, key takeaways, and I'm gonna, we'll have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, we can improve our safety culture locally, um, each of us, as we work on it organizationally. Um, we need to continuously learn from the adverse events that happen, do so promoting these principles of just culture, uh, promote transparency, learn from both what goes wrong and what goes right, um, use theories of human error as you work on evaluating cases, understand cognitive bias and um, think about how we learn from diagnostic errors. And those errors may require a bit of a different approach as we're going about learning. And this culture work just needs to continue because it's essential to what we're doing. Um, we all determine how we and our teams respond to errors. So, um, you know, again, create a supportive learning environment, um, be intentional about the use of the algorithm, empathetic, think about the system, question why the deviations occur and also why they don't, role model the behaviors that you want to see, give effective feedback, and ask for help when you need it. And you're not sure how to respond to something that's occurred. There are plenty of people around in this environment, many of whom I've met last night and I look forward to uh, talking with further today, who are well versed in these in these principles. And uh, I hope that my discussion about them has, you know, offered a, you know perhaps a little bit of a different perspective um, and created a, a di and will create a dialogue that we can have both now and in the uh, days and months to come. And with that, I'm going to stop. Um, unshare my screen and um, really would be happy to have any questions or comments. Um, but I really, you know, again, appreciate the opportunity to speak with you this morning. Um, I love giving these Zoom talks uh, 3,000 miles from home because the, uh, the, uh, the picture is clearer. But thank you again for inviting me. Thank you so much for coming, Dan. And, and you know, we're, the, those electrons are really saving um, really saving some uh, distance they have to travel, unless, of course, we're sending them around the world in order to get back here. Never can tell. Uh, but thank you so much uh, for joining uh, us today. Uh, I'm looking forward to, you know, in the next little bit, and for those that see us in the hospital, uh, taking Dan around a little bit. Uh, uh, we have a few minutes, Dan, if we, if we could. Um, so this one I got in text, I thought it was great. Uh, you know, thinking about the um, uh, safety too, uh, which I think is resonating a lot with, uh, with folks. Um, you know, uh, what are the, when, when you do a, a safety two lecture, what are the outcomes, uh, sorry, the safety two analysis, what are the outcomes of a great reflection uh, on what went right? Um, so that's a terrific question. And I'll start by saying, um, I don't know the complete answer to that yet. I, you know, I think we're still learning and practicing and finding the ways to do that. But I guess what I would say is, it's not dissimilar to the reverse RCA, if you will, where the key drivers or the, you know, the root causes of why things went in one direction, you're just analyzing it from the positive deviance perspective. So, um, you know, what were the policies and practices that contributed? Why were those followed? Um, uh, you know, it would take the same systematic, if you have the same systematic, whether you use a fishbone or, you know, any other tool for case review that you get to here are the reasons why this occurred. You know, it was very unsatisfying the, the case in Colorado where it was we happened to have redundancy in the ICU. We can't we can't program that as a system. Um, the availability bias of the of the previous case was luck. Um, but you know, the case in, in Philadelphia, it really it happened because of a really systematic training plan for resuscitation. And the question we then asked is, okay, well. So what then? You know, not only what are we doing in the ED, but how do we use similar approaches so that we're prepared in other parts of the organization? Um, so it's you know finding action items that relate back to what we think are the primary drivers of the successful outcome. Um, but again, I think we're still learning how to do this. Thanks, Dan. I'm going to just keep going uh, quick if I yeah. can. Um, a question around uh, you know the pre-programming of errors uh, uh, and asking for your sort of thinking about how common those are specifically uh, you know with diagnostic errors how much of them are you know sort of pre-programmed by things like smart phrases that EMRs you know almost mm -hmm. force uh, folks to use uh, yeah. uh, just to get be able to get efficiently through the day. 
Um, yeah, so, um, you know, um, I had a chance to, you know, talk a little bit with Natalie last night about some of your clinical informatics work here, which similarly, you know, have important um, informatics efforts happening, you know, where I am now. Um, the way that the electronic medical record is set up to help make people's documentation more efficient um, can certainly introduce uh, the risk of additional cognitive biases. Um, I don't know that I would say it's pre-programmed as much as I would say is that the errors may be enabled by the documentation systems and um, anything that we can do that forces, um, particularly at handoff or in situations where we would benefit from having what we've been calling a diagnostic pause because you know, asking an intentional question, you know, what is my level of certainty of, you know, what the working diagnosis is and building those sorts of um, enabling strategies into the EMR, I think is one way to think about it. But again, I don't think the final story is written on that. I can maybe get a few quick ones in here. Uh, does Pop have a mechanism for clinicians to come in and discuss errors in your message, in your misses? Um, I'm not exactly sure what what um, I'm not actually sure what that means. Let me, let me try it this way. Um, we have a number of peer support type programs where people can, um, something called Care for Colleagues, um, that is a structured program. Um, I think there's a lot of, you know, individuals, with, you know, a couple of physicians who are really focused on well being in their divisions who make themselves available to people that are struggling. Certainly, uh, employee assistance programs, you know, for people that are really struggling. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I think that we have an opportunity to more fully develop um, those support mechanisms and a culture that, um, that really helps people feel like they're going to be supported through um, a difficult situation that they may be dealing with. I hope that answers the question. I think it does. I'll see if we can get two in with one minute apiece. Uh, right. uh, Dr. Wang asked a question. It relates basically to using HRO uh, concept, a manufacturing concept in, you know, and applying that into systems where we're involving humans, which are variable. Uh, uh, what was, and what was and, the one after HRO theory? What was the second? Uh, and, and applying it into the care for humans, which are variable, right? Yeah. And so, um, you know, how do you deal with the fact that sometimes protocols need to be uh, 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 not just followed uh, because they're of the variability of, of people? Yeah. Um, Okay, so it's not a one minute answer, but let me say this. I think that um, the principles of high reliability theory, which I love talking about, um, I'm gonna hone in on um, situational awareness and commitment to resiliency, that really understanding what's happening at the front line in, in today's environment and figuring out how do we design our systems in order to be able to respond because people, when people are needing to make changes because of the conditions on the ground, um, uh, it is a part of what complex adaptive system thinking is. And um, those, two, those two principles are intention that we have human beings that we know are gonna make errors and we're trying to have reliability. How do, how do you jive those? Um, I think what it is, is that um, we wanna keep redefining, re redesigning our systems to make the error less and less likely to happen because we've made it as easy as possible for people to do the right thing under a wide variety of conditions. So that's the one minute answer of a 60 minute talk. Thanks so much, Dan. You know, we're out of time. So I just want to answer to Laura Bai, who's got a couple of thumbs up on, on her question about just culture. Uh, specifically yeah. here, I just want to say, Laura, you know, we, we've tried to take a lot of the just culture uh, elements and put them in our mission zero work in terms of cultural change. But uh, for, for folks who uh, really resonated with what Dan's saying, um, you know, senior leadership of the organization has been actively talking about not if, but when we make uh, you know, specifically the Just Culture algorithm something that we would implement here at Stanford Children's and finding the right time to do it. it it'd, be a, it'd be a significant um, uh, effort. We wanna make sure it'd be like one of our core goals or something. And you know, uh, in a year or two, I think that's, that's, that's the current plan. So let me end there on time and say, Dan, I just can't thank you enough for coming and to everyone that attended. Thank you so much for being here and for uh, uh, being part of a community that really cares about how we deliver care uh, safely, equitably, uh, efficiently, uh, with a really high quality. Uh, and uh, it's just wonderful to have uh, so many colleagues near and far that are working to try to continuously improve. 
Uh, Dan, thank you again. Thanks to everyone. Thanks, for thanks again for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. I look forward to spending the rest of the day. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.